well who are waiting for the audience participants to gather. I will take a chance of saying a few words I have in mind regarding Mr. Elmia Vienna. As a teacher of English literature in college, as some of you might know, as my students, I migrated to the Sodom University in the Department of Wisdom. Since then, English literature drops behind the veil and the soul literature comes forward in me. And I have very little time to get myself acquainted with the vast Miso literature, some of which I have read in my childhood, which still lingers very clearly in my mind, but most of the academic compilations, which we call songs or hymns or poems in Miso, novels, drama, etc. I have no time to go through them and I am not qualified to speak any critical judgment on this whole literature. But any little thing I read in this whole literature, I have to confess that not merely because it is my own language, but the innocence, the purity of the soul literature strikes me as very unlike English literature. By innocence and purity I mean that it is free of any stringent philosophy. The soul literature is a description, a presentation of Miso life. And if Miso people have any philosophy, it will be immanent in their writing. But so far, the songs of pre-Christian times had some philosophical views perhaps connected with their religion. But after Christianity, Miso people, I may say, unfortunately, are not allowed to adopt any philosophy except Christianity. When our theologians try to be a little more informed regarding knowledge, we call them liberal, true liberal. And so they talent of the so people even today is somehow restrained by the general opinion of the public. But things are becoming different. With the inception of PC department in the Missouri University and the scholar doing their researches religion and its uh, and its stringent control may not be as strict as before. I would like to encourage scholars in this regard that we shall try to be free of the constraint of any religious bigotry so that our mind can be free to look freely on the human side of Miso people. <coughs> Before I call upon our this person, I will request all participants, audiences, to listen intensely 
to the speakers today. I said intelligently because we in the soul seem to have developed the art of hearing people speak without the intention of intelligently participating in what is being said. This phenomenon I would like to attribute to our culture as Christians who have learned to listen selectively the sound of preaching in almost every worship service, including myself. And also because it is only by listening with ears wide open that we truly participate in the idea which is being shared. I have read two stories written by Elvia Villera, and I have just completed translating his novel, Oliver Pari, into English. <coughs> From my acquaintance with the writer through his works and his mind, several images of him appear to me on the small canvas of my mind. Most vivid of the images is his meticulous observation of nature not as a transcendentalist, nor as a moralist, but as participating in nature. An example may show this, that we quote from the translation. On that sunny, on that sun beaten day, when the cicadas sang in the hazy tree tops, and clever chameleon rose pots, it was not alone, those at the free cow stream, Robin the jungle, in the cool forest shade where lazily bachelors airing romantic tunes, the doleful song of young men and the sound of girls cutting wood did not seem to disturb the deep silence of the forest. There was a moderately big pool on the stream, the small fishes peacefully swimming there and the quivering waters seemed not to envy the birds above. The little fish who might not vie for a home in the caves seem to say as you peer at them, I don't like your eyes. As they skittle toward the dark corners, the prawns, however, asserted themselves against the intruders, swimming fearlessly with legs cracked wide. But as you try to catch them, they sprung with lightning speed as if to say, Catch me if you can and go on at it. This is a very crude translation perhaps, but in Miso it's very, uh, very, uh, very engrossing how Pierre Viviana communes with nature. I do not know if Pierre was a painter, but he seems to have the mind of a painter when he describes the landscape and the human characters in a picturesque blend of native hue as when he described the little hillock where Holy Bari and her friends used to meet. Next is the brilliant art of characterization. He seldom delineates characters in rigid physical appearance, but by the words they speak. We soon see into each person as they are, and thereby almost reconstruct their physical presence. It is perplexing how we left out the landscape of the landscape in a display of the plains around Sutra, where his character spent almost ten years, considering he never misses a chance to throw up in living details the river, the hill slope, the clouds and living creatures. The clarity with which he described the scene in minimal words shows the power of his imagination, not the vast landscape, but a particular view, a locale, with minor but essential detail as a typical tanho tree leaning towards a hill slope, making us think he took the scene from life. Is well a part of love story? If so, it is the most incomplete one. Lovers have so little time together here, unless love in absence is a measure. Instead, one can almost trace the shadow of the Nietzschean Superman complex. 
is the persistence of the author to bring the characters together through bitter and presumably a surmountable odds. For all I recollect, love in the popular sense depicted in standard novels is not built with. Then I remember he was son of a popular pastor in an era of extremely Buddhist Christianity. In brief, I consider Piagliana not a Walsokian romantic, neither a transcendentalist nor a naturalist, but almost Keatsian in his identification with nature. Thank you. I don't know if you agree with my observation, but now we are here enough to start the seminar, the presentation. I would like to introduce our source person. The farthest, will you please stand, Mr. David Lapley, from the United Kingdom. Dr. John Lapley, from India. <laughs> Professor Zach Uma, from Tahan, Myanmar. <laughs> Mr. Tang Moya, from Tahan, Myanmar. What request I would like to make is to our non-Indian resource persons to read your paper in Indian speech, in missile speak or rather, so that we may not miss any word you speak, not as in speak ordinarily, but slightly lower and uh, pronounce the words clearly so that our students may intelligently listen to your papers. So now let us hear from Mr. David Nutley. Let us clap our hands. In middle speech, did I hear him say in middle speech? <laughs> Coming to David. Coming to a middle. <laughs> It's an uh, respected moderator and colleagues. It's a real honor to be here today before you. I feel really privileged to be able to come here and um, talk to you and to celebrate with you this birth centenary of El Biancaria, uh, the first Mizzou novelists. novelist. It's an amazing thing to be the first person to do something. It, it must be an amazing thing. I don't know whether Bia Clara himself was aware that he was the first, but that really is irrelevant. But it's, a, it's a great thing that he did and a wonderful um, demonstration, maybe unknowingly to him, of leadership to the young people of Israel when I read this man's story. See, I have been in Mizraim for about 10 years now. My wife is Mizo, and I've only recently um, come across El Biakliana. I'll get his name better as we go on. <laughs> for El Biakliana, and only recently found about it by my, my, my friend and colleague down here, uh, from, and brother, Fonte. And as I began to read about Biakliana, my heart was touched. So much about this young man touched me. And I was almost in tears when I, when I began to read about him. And I was so proud to be married to a Mizzou and to be in Israel at this time. Because often, you know, especially from the West, where I come from, they, 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 they sort of um, clasp places like India and Mizoram and other places as third, third world cultures. Okay, which to me seems to say they're not quite up to our standard. And I don't like that and I've never liked that. But in some cases, in many, many respects, a place like Mizoram is much purer than the West today. And as our brother was talking about in literature, 
in literature as well. The literature here is pure. It's pure. And um, it's something to be held on to and not spoil. It's so easy to spoil things. We can so easy copy different cultures that we think are better than us or more advanced and educated. But it's not always true that that works. So what I say to Mizo people is be yourself. Just be yourself. Don't, there's no need to copy others. If you're going to copy anyone, copy me after other. <laughs> Do you understand? He's, your, he's, he's a model from Israel. This young man is a model from Israel. And I respected so much of his life as I began to read about him. Now my question was, where does such talent come from? Where does this kind of talent come from? Is it learned? Can we imitate it? Is, it? is it from God? Is it learned? Is it passed down from generation to generation? Because it certainly was a special talent and gift that he had. And I believe all three are evolved. Yes, all good things come from above, all good things come from God. But the kind of environment that a person lives in is very important. Because Beatrice's father was a theologian, he was a, he was a, 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 a famous writer, he was a historian, he was involved in church administration and made many contributions to the Mizo culture. And El Clara, being brought up in such an environment and such a culture, would have received much of what his father already was. Now when you're brought up in an atmosphere, a scholarly atmosphere, you can either choose to embrace it or reject it. But we see very clearly in Bia Clara's life that he chose to embrace the scholarly environment and influence that he was brought up in. And this made him the person that he was. At a very early age, as we know, Bia Clara, he lost his mother, which must have been a dreadful experience for him. Because to lose someone who you're so de dependent on at such an early age, must have been very, very devastating. But at the same time, this, I believe, was also a part of what shaped Bia Clara to be who he was. As a boy, as a boy, his life stood out among his, stood out among, among those around him. He passed all his education requirements, he passed his matriculation, he was admitted into the um, Dahati uh, Cotton College, where he did all his studies. And he studied in um, intermediate art, arts. His, his studies were intermediate arts. And a close friend of his, a friend of his uh, Dr. Re Dr. Zarema, also joined him in, in, in the institution, and stayed. And they stayed together in the same room. So as we Clara left his home. And he went to um, Gohati to study. There was a colleague there from Israel that he could get along with and share the same room with. So he did, he did his studies there. What emerges, what emerges from his study in Beaclana, from a very young age, he, he knew that his life was going to be set apart to serve God and men. He knew that his life was going to be a selfless life. A life serving God and a life serving men. And as, as I speak to you young and young people, I say to you, what is your life going to be? How are you planning your life? It seems that the Eklana, very early in his age, in his life, had decided on the direction that he was going to go in. And that was to, uh, to live a selfless life, serving man and serving God. What have we decided to do with our lives? What are we going to do with our lives if you haven't decided yet? Education is a big thing these days. And sometimes we can be chasing after education, after education, after education. Getting degree after degree after degree. 
This is okay, education is important. It's very important. But at the same time, at the same time, I urge you to seek God Himself to show Him the direction that He wants to lead you in your life. And it may not be in education, it may not be with qualifications. Because many, many people will serve God in amazing, miraculous ways do not have very good educations. Education is good, it's very important. But is it the way that God is leading you with your life? So in... As I studied making Gahati, he, he had all these qualifications and he, he did very well, very well in all that he did. And he was doing well and his life was set, his mind was set for his future to follow in his father's footsteps. And this is the part, when I was reading, reading about Pia Clara, that struck me and almost pulled me to tears. And he was such a bright young man, doing so well, so, doing so well, and then suddenly he was struck down with that dreaded disease of the time, tuberculosis. And how tragic it was that this man so gifted, so used by God, with such potential, with such a future, should be struck down with this horrible disease. Now why? Why did this happen? Why do these things happen to young people, to talented people, to gifted people, to people whose hearts are pure and clean and so on? We don't know the answers to some of these things. After he, was, after he had this, he had this, he caught TB, he had to stop his studies, he couldn't, he couldn't study any longer, and he was brought to Mizoram to the Durkin Hospital. And he was put in a room um, with a friend, and um, the room was called the uh, an Airy Hut. Now the Mizoram name for it is Inde. Tom Veng, is that right? Inte Tom Veng, the airy hut. He spent his time in the Inte Tom Veng with a friend of his or someone he made friends with. And he went through a very painful experience. This was a very, very painful experience. His friend's name was Kaflia. Is that correct? His name was Kaflia. And in this room that they shared in the Tom Veng, they were lonely, they were tired, they were probably shocked to what has happened to them. But with their sickness and in their illness, they decided that that was not going to stop them or affect them from doing what their talents required them to do. So they, they wrote magazines, they wrote books, they wrote a, a, a weekly newspaper that circulated all over the place. So they, in their condition, although their education was stopped, their studies had to be stopped, they didn't stop being creative and using their gifting. And this is what we must be aware of with ourselves. Anything can hit us in life at any time. Sickness can hit us. But are we going to allow these things to stop us? No, we must persevere. We must continue. We must carry on. We must be bold. To comfort themselves, they start, they, they, they study and wrote in art and literature. During their time in Dublin, El Bacchiara's friend, Kafia, he wrote a historical novel called Ching Pui. Have you heard of that novel? Ching Pui. There's a novel called Ching Pui written by Kafia. Um, sorry, Kafia. Two novels written by Bacchiara were Hoilo Puri, is that right? Hoilo Puri and Lali. Lali, I've read Lali. I've read Lali. It's a wonderful story. It's the most beautiful story. Lali is the gospel. Lali has the gospel in it. And I loved reading Lali so much. And it was simple, it was pure, but it was true. 
of some of the conditions here in Mizoram even today. And that was uh, in the last century. He, he developed a very close relationship with Kafir, and that relationship and friendship lasted to the end of his life. After a brief recovery, Bakliana went back to study. He went to the theological college, hoping to walk in his father's footsteps and study in his father and do the same that his father did. But sadly, he became ill again. And then he died at the age of 23 years of age in a Roberts Hospital in Shillong. The same day he was buried in the graveyard in Shillong. And now his students have discovered his grave in Shillong and they've made it very, very nice. This life, this short life of Biakiana was an amazing life. When I look what he produced, when I look what he, he, he did, when I look at the things he had done, when I look at how he was used by God, it is just amazing. His work and his literature did not only come to Mizraim, it went beyond Mizraim. And I sometimes think, I sometimes think to myself, this man passed away at the age of 23 years of age. What would Mizraim be like? See, and he's left us a legacy today. We have a legacy of the Akhliana today. But what would he be left behind to us had he lived this full span life? What would he have left to us? Well, God in his wisdom, allowed him to be taken. But he's left us enough to allow us to do something, to look at his life and to imitate that life, if we are willing, if we can do that. Coming to his literary work, in his short life, Big Biakliana contributed to much of the field of poetry. He composed 20 poems, including my mother's grave. Kanu Klan. You know that song? Kanu Klan, my mother's grave. He, he, okay, you see. That, that's great. He also produced wedding in a club and Christmas songs that are still used in today's wedding hymn books. And he did much work in the world of fiction. Due to his invaluable contribu contribution, To misofiction, Biakliana, by the literary scholars, have suggested that Biakliana be the father of miso novels. So Biakliana is the father of your miso novels, and I'm sure you know these things. After writing those two, two novels, Hoilo Pali and Lali, they were the first and second novels of fiction in miso. Lali is a Christian love story and the first prize winner of a writing, a story writing competition. Lali, as you know, is about a family in the village and the father, it was a Christian family, the father was a drunkard, she had a lovely heart, had a little brother. And there was always turmoil and disturbance in the family because of the, because of the condition of the father who was always drunk. And then her younger brother, and there was a man, a rich man, that they wanted, he wanted his daughter to marry, but she didn't like him. And so she was being forced to marry him, uh, but being an obedient young woman, and a, 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 a very pure young woman, she decided to do that. But something happened, something happened that stopped all that. And Moya was really the young man that Lali liked. But something happened. Her young brother, Zorala, he was very sick and he died. And this brought a shock to the family and a shock to the father. The death of Zorala, Lali's brother, brought a shock to the father. And after he saw that, he 
sewed it up and eventually became a Christian. And Lali eventually married the guy that she liked, which was born to happen. And that's a lovely story. When you read the whole story, you can see the gospel in that story. And it really is a beautiful story. And if you haven't read it, I would really encourage you to read it. Sometimes people need shocking to wake them up from their condition. The Atlanta indicated a deep concern about the treatment of women in society in those days. And we've heard something on that this morning. And the Bible says to us, we are all one in Christ, male, female, rich and poor, slain and free. We are all one. And as we are, as we come from a kind of a culture that does degrade women, as men, we must step in and do what we can to stop that. And we must also treat our women and women as our fellow human beings and not, and not as anyone less than we are, because we are certainly not. Beer Climber was worked out an extraordinary man among his fellow, fellow misers. He was a gifted writer. He had many talents, one being the ability to acknowledge contemporaries. The death of his mother has surely affected the young boy's life and may have helped shape the under his understanding of the human condition in both his suffering and loss. He composed some elegy for his mother's will. He grew up in Saito village, which he really loved, and the people there were very proud to have him as their literary genius. It is believed that some of his works were associated to his village life. One of the things that he did in his village was he wanted to, in, he wanted to encourage the young people to be readers. So he opened a club called the Readers Club and he got books and the young people would come and begin to read literature and he encouraged them to read literature, literature other than his own literature. To educate themselves, to not be ignorant of the things that are going on in this world. He also encouraged them to read English novels and um, he had quite a collection of novels. And he set certain times apart for those people to come and have reading, reading times together. And also, he had other times where they would have entertainment and they would have dramas and reading classes and they were very entertaining. And not only did the young people come along to these classes, also the elderly came along to those classes because they were very excited about it as well. The Clara did many, many things in his community. Many, made many, many contributions, had many ideas and was a really an amazing contribution to his society. Now, can we all be beer climbers? No, we cannot all be beer climbers, but we can imitate his life. We can imitate his life. And as Paul said in the scriptures, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, we can follow beer climber as he followed Christ, who really was his master and was the really one that he really, and was really the one we obeyed. His life was an amazing life. And I would ask you young wizards to study his life more closely and pray and say, I want to be a contribution to my community, to my society. So often we think to ourselves, we can't be like this, we can't be like, we see people with talent, we see people very gifted in many ways, but so often we think, oh, I can't be like them. We immediately put ourselves down. We immediately give up some things before we even start them. We have dreams, we have hopes, we have things that we'd like to do. But often we feel to ourselves, well, we need guidance, we need someone to help us, which is true in so many cases. But what I would recommend, and I say to young people sometimes, don't wait for anyone to start something. You start something. You start something. 
Don't wait around for others to start something. Or you can start things together. But don't wait for others to start something. You start something. And you will have God's blessing on it. We're going to have many questions as we reflect on being a child's life. Why was his life taken away so early? We don't know. We don't know the answer to those questions. But his life did give hope and purpose to those around him. And as we celebrate the centenary of this most exemplary character, El Diaglana, let's thank God for this amazing person among us, who was among us for a short time. He was an amazing young person. And when I see his photograph outside now, he was full of innocence and purity. So we're here today to celebrate his life. And don't let it just be a day, another day, another seminar. Let's learn from his life. Let's copy his life. We can't, some of us can do big things, some of us can do small things. But let's do what we can. As I said, don't wait for others to start something. You start something. And get people together. And at the same time, let us not forget the one today who makes all things happen and makes everything beautiful in his time. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives everything to everyone to do what they can do for the betterment of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David J. Ludwig. We the first person to speak. Uh, we have given him Slide one hour of time, but from now on, since our time is uh, till three o'clock, every speaker has less than twenty minutes. So this time, just keep in mind. Professor uh, Lakri is a missionary and teacher working in different parts of India. He is, he is married with a Mizo girl, and he has two beautiful children. He is residing in. Now, let me call upon the second person to speak. In the program, her name has been uh, given as Mrs. Joanna Hill. But we are familiar with her in the Missouri University as a scholar in Missouri Lang Home Side. She received her PhD in Missouri Lang Home Side. So, we will be very much at home with her and her speech. Let's call upon her. I also respectfully greet our respected organizers and distinguished guests and all our participants and all of you here today. It's a real honor to present a paper before you. And I would also like to particularly thank you for such a warm welcome, especially when I first arrived here in the morning. The staff and faculty from the college and the residents of Saitwa have given me such a wonderful welcome. I really appreciate that. You've made me feel very much at home. And I really feel unworthy or underqualified in front of so many scholars today, literary scholars of Mizor literature. And when I was invited by Bhutwangyana to give a paper today, I really wondered what contribution I could possibly make in front of all of you. I am an ethnomusicologist by training. My field of study is ethnomusicology, which is the study of music in its cultural context. That's really the, the academic background I come from. And I realize there is no ethnomusicology department yet in this arm. Maybe one day. But as of, as of now, there is not yet an ethnomusicology department. But I will be giving a paper based on my studies. So it will be a purely research paper based on my academic background. I apologize if it might be a little dry for you, a little long and boring, but I will try my best to make it, to explain an analytical approach to music which perhaps hasn't been applied here very often. And I hope it will be simple enough to understand that others might also try to apply the same kind of approach to other songs and music here. Now, you might notice I didn't greet the, the moderator chairperson yet. I just wanted to specially mention him. As he informed you, I came here 
a few years ago to do some field work to research here in Mizoram. And I could never have done that by myself. I needed lots of people. I traveled all over Mizoram, talking to people, interviewing people, attending uh, different gatherings of singing. And one person I met was our respected chairperson. So it's a real honor for me to be moderated by him today, to be reunited after several years. And so I want to especially thank him for giving me a warm welcome as well. He, he asked us to speak in Indian speaking speed, I think. But if I do that, I'm very worried I will exceed my 20 minutes. Even if I speak fast, I might exceed 20 minutes. So please bear with me. I will try my best to keep to time. Okay. Though his life was cut too short, El Bhyakyana is known to many within his arm as one of the great literary heroes whose novels enabled him to forge his own reputation, quite distinct from that of his illustrious father, Bhyankaya. He was also an accomplished poet. This is less known than his novels. He was an accomplished poet whose poems suggest a maturity far beyond his years. It's really amazing when you think how young he was when he passed away, what mature work that he produced. This paper will examine just a small sample of his songs, paying particular attention to the melodies which were borrowed from other sources. So through melodic analysis, this is the analysis I'm going to present, this paper will attempt to situate his songs within the context of other popular repertoires from Mizoram's musical heritage. Of course, in such a short time, I can't give much background in this kind of paper, but I would like you to understand, I will be making some generalizations about Mizo music, Mizo traditional music. You might think they are very crude generalizations, and perhaps they are, but they are based on my previous research. So I've kind of summarized my conclusions from my previous research to present a few generalizations. So please understand if something I say seems a little bit too uh, generalized, I'm trying to make things simple for today. This, uh, yes, my initial source, I think for all of us, or most of us here today, my main source was Biagliana Robom, that very good book by our respected coordinator of this, of this good seminar today. So that was the main source that I could start with. And among the other things in that book, there is a great list of Biagliana songs and poems, and it's really helpful because it contains all the information, where the songs came from, where they were translated from. That was really my starting point. And from that list, I identified all the songs whose melodies were easy to find in the songbooks. Redemption songs, Sankey sacred songs and solos. I went back to those original songbooks, the English songbooks, to find out the original tune. And from there, I made a list of 15 tunes that I would try to analyze. Okay, so those 15 songs were chosen, and I analyzed every melody, every tune, using seven parameters. Now, there could be many other parameters that I could have used, but I limited myself to seven, which have in previous studies, my previous research, they proved themselves to be the most illuminating parameters when approaching Mizo song repertoires. And so the aim for me, the aim for today, was to find out where the melodies are situated, the melodies that Biagliana chose to use, they were already existing in other songbooks. The ones that he chose, where are they situated on a hypothetical scale between those that are really Western evangelical hymns and those which have a sound which is more like what we are accustomed to in Mizoram, in so traditional songs and singing. So if we imagine a scale between the two, where do the songs sit that Biakana chose to use, the melodies? I'm talking about the tune in particular today. So I will go on to my analysis part. And these seven parameters I chose were meter, rhythm, structure, pitch, intervals, range, and contour. And before I go on to do anything else, I will outline each parameter as briefly as possible before going into my main analysis and conclusions. So the first parameter was meter. Now I realize I'm talking to a lot of literary scholars. From poetry, you will all understand what meter is in a literary sense. In music, meter is slightly different. Meter is how the music is organized into beats. And we can see by how the conductor beats the music or how the drummer beats the drum. From there, we can understand musical meter. And the favoring of what we call duple or compound duple time, those two types of meter, in Mizoram especially, is easy to observe, especially if you go to church and you look at how the drummer beats, or how the keyboardist even plays 
in duple time. That meter is really the most prevalent here. And the other songs from the songs that I looked at, they are also predominantly in duple or compound duple time. So that shows that from the point of view of meter, he was quite conventional in the songs that he chose. So by choosing duple meters, choosing those songs from the original songbooks, that made them more suitable for, Mizo, for the Mizo church context and more likely to be adopted by congregations because simply because they were in duple time. A few are in triple time, but as you will all know, to be in triple time in the church is extremely uncommon. Okay, so duple or compound duple time is favored here, and that is also what the Aliana favored in the songs that he chose. The second parameter was rhythm. So rhythm is closely related to meter, and rhythm is the combination of long and short beats, and strong and weak beats, and these come together to form the rhythm of the melody, the beat of the melody. And my previous studies have highlighted this, the prevalence of a very simple rhythmic motif in traditional Mizo songs, especially in Len Kormzai, which is simply one beat followed by two half beats, or the other way around. One, two, and, or one and two. It's extremely simple, and it might seem almost too insignificant to mention, but when I was analyzing the tunes of Len Kormzai, this figure came up again and again more than any other rhythmic motif. And so I just wanted to look through the original songs that Biagliana chose and just to look at what kind of rhythmic motif was also used in the songs that he chose. This kind of motif, it might seem too simple, but it naturally lends itself to that duple time beating of the drum. And even a triple or compound duple beat can easily be adapted to this motif. It's very easy to change a triplet beat, one and up, into a one and a kind of motif. I don't know if you're following me, but they are very closely related. It's very easy to shift between the two. And so that's what I found often happens when Western hymns get translated into Mizo, that triplet rhythm becomes a one and a rhythm. Okay, it's not always retained as a triplet as in the original song. And so in compared with Mizo melodies, that particular motif, however simple it sounds, it is actually um, much less common in the hymns found in the evangelical hymn books that Biakliana used. Those hymn books are much more likely to favor dotted, lilting rhythms, da, 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 okay, that kind of rhythm, that in Mizo congregational singing, that's predominantly replaced with straight beats, da, 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 da. The same was found to be true of the sample of Biakliana's songs which I analyzed, but it was also found that some melodies did indeed have rhythms that lent themselves more readily to being transformed into the kind of motif which is very appealing in Mizoro congregational singing. Now the third parameter was structure. And in terms of structure, I was paying particular attention to the melodic relationship between the verse and the chorus. Of course, not every song has a chorus, but those which have a chorus, I was looking at. And uh, some hymns, we can make a distinction between the hymns whose choruses have almost no melodic relationship to the verse. The chorus is completely different musically from the verse. And other hymns use almost the same musical material again in the chorus. So there's that distinction that can be made. And in the evangelical songbooks that Biakliana used, we can find a mix of all those different types of hymns. Now from my previous studies of indigenous Mizo hymns, especially in Kormzai, they show a tendency to make less distinction between the verse and the chorus, if there's any distinction at all. Usually the chorus will have the same melodic content as the verse. And Biagana's choice of melodies, interestingly, they also show a great preference for melodic similitude between the verses and the chorus. And in many instances, the melodies in the verse and chorus are exactly the same. That's what Biagana chose from the English songs themselves. And so that makes his choices eminently suitable for the Mizo context. So we can see in terms of structure, he was choosing songs that had a structure that was already appealing in the Mizo context. Now the fourth parameter was pitch. Pitch is the variety of high and low notes, and they are used together to form the melody. Pitch is one of the main ways in which Mizo traditional music, including Lenkwongzai, can be distinguished 
from Western music. This is something everyone will tell you if you ask them about Len Kuomzai. This is something that they will immediately say. Because Western hymns can be described as diatonic. Diatonic means there are eight notes in the scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. All those eight notes might be there. Okay, that's what we mean by diatonic. It's in a, it's in a key. But Mizo music generally, the traditional music, can be described as pentatonic. Pentatonic means there are five notes in the scale, and I've really studied the pitches used in the songs, and it's not just any five notes. Pentatonic scales are used all over the world, but in Mizo music, it's a very special type of pentatonic scale. Every note, every, five, every, every single one of the five notes has its own identity, its own behavior. Okay, so it's a unique Mizo pentatonic scale. And so, the analysis did indeed show a higher prevalence of the 4th and 7th pitches, Fa and Ti. Those are found in lots of Western music, Fa and Ti. In his own music, you will hardly find any Fa and Ti, those 4th and 7th pitches. So, of course, that's what we would expect. And so his songs are, of course, absolutely diatonic in nature, and they conform to the Western melodic conventions for which they were originally composed. We can't expect anything more than that. They were taken from the Western repertoire. However, I do want to know two songs which actually were almost pentatonic when you look at the pitches which I used. So I just want to mention those. One was Iswad Sakma Hintakin. That one is almost pentatonic in, in scale. And Dume Karinzu, that one also, that is almost pentatonic. Okay, so those two I just want to mention as being especially interesting in the pitches that they use. The fifth uh, parameter was intervals. The size of the jump between notes is called an interval. So some, notes, some songs you're singing up and down, up and down a lot, the intervals are very large. When the intervals are small, the flow is very easy because the notes are all very close together. And technically, it can be said that Western hymns are more disjunct. That means there are lots of large intervals. But Mizo hymns are generally more conjunct. The intervals are smaller. It's easier to sing, actually. Many Mizo writers and commentators have made the same observation. And indeed, there is a great level of disjunct movement found in Piagliana songs because they are from the Western repertoire. And the direction of jumping, this is what's more interesting, the direction of the jump was generally in an ascending movement. So you're jumping up all the time. You might fall down a bit, but lots of jumping up is there. And it's in this ascending direction, perhaps more than in the simple disjunct movement, that Western melodies are alienated from traditional Mizo singing, which generally favors conjunct falling movements. I know I'm telling you things that you already know. Okay, this is the music that you've grown up singing, but I'm just presenting a way to approach it, a way to analyze it that might be new to you. I'm not sure. Another feature of Mizo singing is the heavy repetition of pitches, especially the median pitch, mi. If we think of do, re, mi, mi is repeated again and again and again before falling down to do. That's the movement that generally happens. That repetition is very important. And of course, in contrast to the original Mizo songs, there are comparatively few instances of pitch repetition, especially the median pitch in Piagliana songs, because they are translated songs or borrowing tunes from the Western repertoire. Now I'm almost there. The sixth perimeter was range. And range is simply the size of the gap between the lowest note of the song and the highest note of the song. That's what we call the range. And compared with Mizo songs, Western hymns can have a very large range, extending from so below do all the way up several pitches higher than do. It can have a very big range, more than one octave. Sometimes they require great vocal dexterity. And in the songs that Piagliana chose, there was a fairly even split. Around half of them had a very large melodic range, and half of them had a much easier, smaller melodic range. Now the seventh and final parameter was contour. Contour is the overall direction or flow of the melody. Draw out, if you draw it out as a line, sometimes it can look like a hilly or mountainous horizon, looking at the line of the tune. There are certain contours, such as falling motifs, which lend themselves more 
to Mizo singing. I already mentioned the contour falling between me down to Do. That contour, that long line that then drops down. So that one is very important. So looking at the uh, intervallic analysis of the Apiana songs, uh, the contours are generally ascending and disjunct. The contours are quite different. But again, I just want to mention two songs again, the same song I mentioned before, which does actually show a lot of contours which are very suitable for Mizo singing. So again, I want to mention Iswad Sakna Ahim Takim and Jerusalem Karim Rokwi. Okay, those two have very uh, good contours that relate closely to Mizo singing. Now these are the seven parameters and just some of the findings which they reveal. But superficially, they tell us very little about Yagyana's decisions. And they very, tell us very little about their relationship with the words which he composed for them. So in order to delve deeper, the songs can actually be grouped. I was not expecting to have this kind of finding, but looking into the research, I was able to make three groups. And uh, these are based on the analysis I've done. So the three groups are these. The first group are those which can be described as the most unconventional, bearing almost no relationship to Mizo musical aesthetics. They are completely alien to traditional Mizo singing. That's the first group. Almost every feature I looked at, they were very, very Western in style. There was nothing that would really relate to the Mizo context. The second group sits in the middle of the scale, and they can be called the most neutral because they have an equal balance. It's like a tug of war, and they are just tied in the middle. Okay, so they have an equal balance of characteristics that relate to both Western and Mizo aesthetics. So they're being tied, tied in the middle, and instead of saying neutral, we can even say they have the most tension because they are being pulled to each side, and no side is winning. Okay, they are there, being tied tightly in the middle. And finally, the last group has an unusually and probably unexpected high level of features that appeal to the Mizo musical aesthetic. So that's the final group. And I'm going to examine each of these groups in turn, if time permits. I'll try my best. So the first group, as I said, they bear very little relationship to Mizo musical style. But there may be very interesting reasons behind Yagliana's choices to use such unusual and difficult tunes. Why would he choose to choose such a difficult tune? So one example from this group is Kanutron China. According to the account of Kiseni, who had looked after him in Dutlan, quoted in Biakiana, Biakiana the Wong, Biakiana often used to sing this song, My Mother's Prayer, privately. He used to sing it privately in English, and it was especially meaningful to him, as he had lost his mother at a young age. He even informed Kiseni when he had completed his translation. The hymn was obviously of great personal significance to him, and although even the original hymn is found in both Redemption Songs and another songbook, Alexander's Hymns, it may be identified not really as a congregational song, but a song for performance. And so certainly, both the English and the Mizo versions of this song are hardly sung today. It's not a very well-known song, even in English. But perhaps it's because it was really never meant to be a congregational song. That was not the point. And of all of Biakiana's songs, this was the melody that was the most unsuited to his own congregational singing, whether respect, with respect to the meter, the intervals, the range, or the contour. However, it is clear that to Biakiana, this was not a primary concern when translating a song with such a deeply personal meaning. So perhaps that's why he chose this song, not because he wanted everyone to be able to sing it, but because it meant a lot personally to him. Another song from this first group, I won't mention all the songs, but another song is uh, Isonzela. This is essentially a patriotic song, but Yagyana chose to set it to the tune of Nairu Kuna which is also a hymn about the call to Christians to work as soldiers. So, this is just my idea, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it may be described as a sophisticated example of Kaihekla, since Biagliana took what was basically a military Christian song and secularized the words while retaining the theme of calling young people to action. Therefore, although the tune he chose is one of the most difficult to sing, it's unusual, it's not really suitable for congregational singing, its strikingly militaristic style matches very well with the intent of Biagliana's poem. 
Those are just two examples from the first group. The second group, I also mentioned two examples. These may be described as the ones with a lot of tension, as I mentioned before. And uh, such a neutral tune, the tension is there. In one of Yagyana's best known translations, Zodu Itiante, in the pitch and rhythm, it could almost be a traditional Mizo melody. You would all recognize that particular characteristic. But in the range and in the contour, its western origin, origins become more apparent. As Bukwanyana has already pointed out in Yagyana Rabom, the special quality of this particular translation is Biagliana's use of indigenous Mizo themes and imagery to translate what was otherwise a very generic English text. Therefore, the neutrality of the tune, sitting right in the middle of the scale, that tension, is also reflected in the translation, sitting right in the middle between a straight English translation and a pure Mizo poem, it's sitting right in the middle. And so, although it has that tension, it's been granted a unique Mizo affectation in the course of its translation. The tune and the text work closely together to present a most powerful example of the synthesis between Western and Mizo musical aesthetics. Another example from this group is Vulmoin's play part. The interaction between different musical features is especially interesting here, since whereas rhythm and meter normally go together, and range and contour normally go together. This time, it's the rhythm and the range from each side. They are the ones which are more reflective of the traditional Mizo style. And the meter and the contour, again, come together towards a, a Western style. And there is real tension then in the melody's relationship to its context. And this tension is again reflected very effectively in the text. Since in some respects, and it can be thought of as another example of Kailekla, a Christian song that has been modified to give it a more sentimental meaning. And that tension associated with the extent to which the text deviates from its Christian origins is well reflected in the melodic tension that also exists. And it's interesting to note that in the book, Bukwadiana uh, also points out that it may be more beneficial to read that particular text rather than sing it. And that reflects my analysis of the tune as well, that perhaps by reading the text, uh, we might receive more than by just singing it as a congregation. Now we come to the final group that contains numerous well-known examples of Biagliana's songs. These are the songs which show an unusually strong relationship to Mizo aesthetics unexpectedly because they come straight from the Western songbooks we really don't expect much to be there. They were never intended to be translated into Mizo. But these are the songs which naturally have that tendency to be well adapted into Mizo. And it was very interesting to observe that these particular groups of songs have actually been the most enduring in popularity in Mizo. And these are the ones which remain in print in the hymn books. It's therefore clear that the choice of melody is extremely important in determining which songs are going to become popular among the congregations. It's not just about the text, the tune is also very important. The congregation may not be aware themselves, but even the most well-translated poem, might be the best translation, is unlikely to become popular unless the melody or the tune is also attractive, easy to sing, and suitable to the context. So the first song I will mention from this group is in Nehnata, perhaps the best known of all the Ariana songs. And it's no surprise that this song also happens to be the song that most closely corresponds with Mizo musical characteristics in all the parameters that I looked at. Another example is, again, Iswan Pena Kahima, which is also in the Mizo Christian Hebrew, attribu attributed to Dr. R.K. Kakriana, who maybe he also translated it at a different time, but it seems that Biagliana also translated it. Jerusalem Kaindopui and what we heard today, Amel Narama, and other well-known examples from this group, which are often included alongside original Mizo compositions. And even these songs, they are just translations, but they are often associated with the Lenkonsai repertoire. You heard the choir today. It would be very difficult to tell whether it was a translation or not just by listening to the tune. So those are really associated with other original Mizo songs. And we all know that translations are rarely 
included among those kinds of songs. So their acceptance within that Lenkonda type of repertoire really shows the suitability of their tunes to the Mizo context. And that's what my analysis found separately. It came to the same conclusion. And it's also been acknowledged in the book. The same kind of comments are there. In all these songs, it's only the contours that stand out as being unusual, but these, of course, contribute to the necessary distinctiveness of every song. Every song needs to have a different tune. So, of course, the contours are going to show some distinctiveness. Another song uh, from this group is Iswa Tsapna Hyundagin. As a song that expresses longing for heaven, it immediately appeals to the sentiment of an important group of Mizo compositions, generally known as Vanon Mekha. Again, the melody is extremely favorable for Mizo singing, and only the, the appearance of the note fa as the highest pitch, that's the only part of the song which seems a little strange. And so that's what, another example from that group. A similar song in terms of theme is Gong Kuali Muntrai, which is also a translation, which is also included in the Christian Labu. There are so few aspects of that particular tune that are unsuitable for the Mizo context that it's almost a wonder that it was not translated before. However, it was indeed Yakuya who identified the song and produced the translation which endures today. There are many other themes which I had wanted to discuss today, but they may have to wait till next time. I'm especially fascinated with Yakuya's preference for the redemption song, Songbook, uh, since in comparison with Sankey's sacred songs and solos, it has been used comparatively few times by other Mizo translators. And I had a quick check through the Christian Labu, and a brief review of other translators who used redemption songs shows that they were all of an earlier generation. The pioneer missionaries, the first generation Christians, they are the ones that used redemption songs. The only ones that came later were Biyakiyana and Siyabiyama. Those are the only two in the Christian Habu that used redemption songs in a later generation. So I find that interesting. That's worthy of further study, I think, which songs were used at different times. We can assume that Biyakiyana inherited his fondness for that particular songbook, maybe from his father, who also used it. But we've also seen today that he himself was a shrewd selector of songs, and he evidently found much in this particular songbook that he imagined would be suitable for translation into Mizo. So in conclusion, starting from just the raw material of the melodies that Biagliana favored, we have identified three groups of songs. And these groups present to me a rather illuminating suggestion that indicates that the methodology employed today may be beneficial. I don't know what you think. It may be beneficial in future studies of similar repertoires by other composers. The songs which were found to have the most in common with traditional Mizo songs were also found to be those which have endured in the hymn books and in public popularity. The songs which had the least in common are the ones uh, which were least intended for congregational singing. They were intended for his private use. And finally, those which exhibit that tension between the different styles and neutrality were those which were, which textually, if you look at the poem themselves, they also contained the greatest tension between generic and western and local Mizo concerns. So whether Biyakiana intended such tendencies is another matter. But it is hoped that this analysis presented here will go some way towards explaining why some of his songs have endured very well and why others perhaps have not. The answer may not just lie in their quality or in how they were disseminated, but they may in part lie in the melodic content itself. So I would encourage you, if you can, whenever you look at songs, try to look at the tune as well. That's what I want to leave with you today. Thank you very much for listening. from abroad is very rare in our circle. I pray that uh, our coordinator and her department, Professor Tualiana, uh, 
past couple of kids' paper we talked with in our department job there, so that it would help the students and scholars. Because that kind of paper is uh, perhaps one of the first we have seen, uh, very uh, skillful uh, analysis of our visual traditional song. So thank you very much. Now, our time is very limited. Also, say Kuma and Mr. Tanamoy have to divide between themselves the remaining time. And since they are going to speak in visual, I think they need not to read through the papers uh, because they have been written here in the books. So they could just summarize their papers so that we can uh, finish in time. There is another session after this. There is tea time at 3 o'clock. So I pray that they will uh, make an effort to give time. First, the same group. Afternoon, everyone. Mm. It's becoming kind of common to hear and speak English and Missouri. Now, I'm going to say something uncommon to salute your Minglao, which reflects um, the country where I come from. Um, from Myanmar, I have been local to the country of 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 the country อ่าไฮไลท์ใส่ตัวเรื่องกระดูกบอสเซ่ตัวบัตรเชียร์นะมินิสอมนี่อาจารย์ครับแล้วตัวหลังมั่วอันนี้ชัวร์มินิสอม
tin adetu tan po pon lam thal dal ang nilawa mani in thal ala ki aniya wangin mo ko na ten chan in chanin lum tru na le nong o na aten tela lom chung ze ni ma so na kong a zo pir thei zo ani ti bia le nan an ko kum chunga ma so na bidashi na atho na atilang kat thei o me o na enton ka mi chen ko mani ta chon o ta na na a ve na a ane na khat le thei lo ba do tala a thu zir pir na ka tu te chu romola in ko pa ze rin a zir pir chi ti kan mu Kamalai tu ni ating zong ngay eh at yung mong le ani ang kagilaya sa itual komitun teka biyak le na 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 TV ang kaya ang kita jam di kong ngay sa kurong lo hey po yan kay ni po ina local komitun minjo ni kan laga kay chon kay tiyot halong teh bidan ang kay chon lo na na mani lang inventor le kan in munram ni chunga oro teh มีแต่อินมุนรัมเรียบไปไม่ลงตัวนิ่งมินฟุตเตลอันนี้ปับลิกเอจูเกชั่นอันนี้เสียหลังเมตตาเมตตาตัดชวนกันมีมาโมเตอันนี้ตัดชวนมีตั้งตู้มาไงสักเอ็มโมไงก้อยโมฟักเอ็มโมลำกันตุ้งเราจู่มีเยาว์บางอามีไงก้อยโมตู้กันเด็กเจมพาตัวปุ่นปุ่นกันที่บกเห็นเราบาเซ่จู่ชวนเฟงหวงพ่นหวงเดือดร้อนหวงเสียมเราเบี้ยเลยนะทุ่งชวน Mi voi kat akhir to, hotju atau hil lehai to lupa. Abang masa tua jang zat zat teh teh mi jeng hong ani kilau panu ciro ani lo. Mi song song ha ada tu buaya angai sakin angai koi mau vek teh. Cumi net le cia ju, cumi net le cia ju. Mi song song angai na a atu le an angai em em vek mai ko. Amahan mi mi teh le mi ni. No bang le bul ting kuo kuo le to duo ten mun an ka an chang vek he ka mi chung chua mi zia an yi lo min en mi zia chung e ka an kuo chua na mi cheng kong tam tak te chu an cheng von a le ya thil fel lo le an yi tu rang ni lo an mu yin an yi sum te lo ba chong ka le che zia te hi e la te lang yin an cha le chi ma se bia le chu chu te an yi be lo มีเฟลเตอร์มีเสียคลาบุยอังทบินอัชินเพจูอัชเชเบียวเขามาเซทิลเฟลโลเลนิตูร์อังนิโลอัมุอินอัชเชเบลเลเจนกุยเตตานาเฟอมตูร์ขบเอโมเนลอมโลตูร์ขบเอโมอินอัชชาเลนไนบวะอินซูมินเนมตะกาฟินอัสกิร์เทเซลค่ะอัฟอมเลนิเฟลเลเจนกุนเฟลเลเจนกุนอัฟาราทินเชียนะกิลังอาอังวันบวนโลตูร์เลทินเชียทิ้งทออังอังอาคมเล็กหรือว่าจะช่วยคุมรุ่มลงทุกคนเองที่คนนั้นมีที่มีจมินปับลิกเอชเกตุลอันนี้นะอันนี้เอ็นต้นตัวมินหุ่นเชียนี่อินอะไรบีนะทุกสองเลยกองทารกดับเร่งตัวนี้คนล้างเสียมชัดนาฮีโกฮันินอาไวเวสีดอกจวนอินบูคอมันนี่เส้นเส้นเทียนโลเล่อินฟุนเส้นเส้นเทียนโลจ๊อกคนเราไปดูเด็กมดชวนมาลาเล็กเล็กตักตักหลงสอบพัฒนาที่การคริสเตียนด่านอาการขับนุ่มไม่เสียสุ่มบอลเที่ยวเที่ยวพ่อของการสุ่มบอลลายาปฏิญาณตานีที่อาเดเรกับพ่อที่เป็นเด็กคนง่ายหลงกันสอบการที่บ้านเป็นสุ่มบอลเล็กคอยเจ็ดเฮ็กสอบการที่บ้านเป็นสุ่มบอลเล็กคอยจะเห็นยินมุนอารวาคุณะเล่มดูตัวกันมานี่ปะทาลูเล่มไม่เสียเด็กกันยินุ่ม Masa kandung bayi boleh rotuan kubel ya, cuma orang song-song kita lepas dah ni menurut tuh si, petian tak le kubel tak dia ramai kan lo kambei, adik mewah angin le, dia le nasi aku zirtir buah cuan cuti yang ni belo. Masa dia le nasi cuan, kati hundai ko acang kan, kotang siang cende di masong ni, kotang buah le aku panjang ko akan di turvefe ani di, lo mufiin. Ang kuwa sa kuwa sa lahat ng tuhun din na ju lalo pa le ko hong upa te in di chok in don chok rin na siyan pa rin ang lo wang manak polisi ang lo duwang chok tayo to hi til maktar na ka at liga ni asa kong tu chalun siya siya kati ang kota le ko hong dan duwang na hi alaw ang fuwa 
ชูชูออดเวลินฮะเดียงเดียงอดวงชั่วโปอะนิมานามาเซชูชวนอะฟะกอมนะอะดิเนบจวงโลเลกะเชียงไมเนไงนาติฮีแอคทีฟรีเด
Es la primera mafasia. Son una tu y camu de tabua artigan. Quina tu don solo. Bien, bien. Y ha hacia firme. La huella. Tinsu, bien, bien. Cajia también. Tinsu, mafasia. Cajia también. Bien, bien. Tinsu, con la santa. Ea. Regula tanga. Taha. Pajo. Chonua. Ey. Un profesor. Profesor Lalu Yen yang di WhatsApp dia dengan aku bom di tahan kerja sok dua library yang aku akan share dengan anda dah dia dengan aku kerja yang dia dia lah amat kena sana asal tu tu aku di zaman ini doktor ini pun sok beri dua dia dia lah pun sedih dia sampai apa sebenarnya dia lah Soal kami, mai bawa paper cia dora bintai sini kalau tak salah ni dia di situ al boinkan seminari buat situ te situ al jadi kerap te tujuan MLA te dan zaman universiti te semua kalau tak salah ni dia kan situ ni. Ada mana saya tuan mungkin dia sakai dan kambang sunbo, ati lupa, tangkar jangan sangsok dengan tempat nu, atau deh lah, anda cai lat lat, lat turun buat tiang, dia punya najian, kongsong pada ini lat pada ini, novel lain nombor tak le, bujung tak, boleh lupa ni, asyik tiang tua, kongsong pakua ada ini story cetak lalati asyik bok, an novel dia. Kau dah upah dia, uang amfel tak ada ya? Acang tu temisia dia tak mai le, ngai lom tak in aku suka. Alai kau nak kira nama tu di apa yang kau mishim ini kau nak tiru sentuh de from komen mishim ini dia inlay china kau tahu kau le akan tiru dalam sampai atai dengan history tiru sentuh dengan nam zetelin amang tangkaya share tu deh ni lah. ทุกสัปดาห์ทุกอาทิตย์ทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือนทุกเดือน
Abang Biang mai dia acian ngai lebang tinggi pun di ngai dong ia adik dari lebang kotong kolej gawat dia jenis sanggau acun jom tumpua pat nam subjek lembat dari fahamin kolej asam ma poin sab lebur tetap tak acian to ngai acian to ngai yang dipohi hari luar ni lom Jom balik ke Fuchia, cinta tu dia punya nak dibuat muncul satu, tu leh dah lama angkat tuan lah cop satu, final aku cop mana anime yang tinggi printer dua ane dong. Hari lupa dia bisau leh tu perlahan manusia leh berfungsi atau dia aku cop apa tu bangun yang dia novel di regional novel siara agai di impasan di moment tu malam bisau tu pun leh ikhlas sana Thailand main baka. So, what may you want to take to Nusa? So, from, from, and then that, Sabong, Par, Rampar, to Kumpilik, Tiger, Bakul, Laikin, Nalim, Aikwang, Klem, Teh, Labin, and Thailand. So, we see that Nusa, Chen Katesuan, and Mami, Chen Tiamin, and Siam, to Al Fakroma, the Yen, as we hear that, get to another bone, take to Nusa, so we can talk now. So, one thing that Mabe, Kampar, you go, and Mat Jono, Mabe, ประกอบเด็กที่คุณเป็นผู้ช่วยเด็กที่เด็กที่คุณดีกับมองทันฟงชิ้นคุยโอเทเต้ไรวงคุณเต้ปาร์โมชั่งฟงฟาร์ตั
Patiam Ubutum Dana, Le Kazir and Ita of Amin, Zorama Christiana, at Tide of Mark or Tana, Asia Novella, Siam to Dile, Patian Deeping Day, at Highland Tarpa, and Novella at some two departments to get the Papang, Patian Mokus one day, or Patian in Ompuro, a railroad at the M. T. Day, a Toba Toba, so on, Patian. Loman minum tani di te asal suatir ialah hei yang dia kena di sa komitah anisia ada lembok hei yang novel puiting original novel le panoramik novel mai baka historical novel asia lab hei kolej pop arab lom kumson perih valin asuar kita mai di lai sanu ruang anilom Hello, hello. Hello, Barry. Here, Jeff. Here, he is Tilji. He is a son of me. The real life is in Swan and in Zia. At that time, Zia played. We saw them here. 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 Thank you, all the speakers. This is David Nadui, Dr. John Aiki, Dr. Sekuma, Dr. Tang Moya. Your papers would be valued, and preferably, uh, if you can leave it to be read by all the participants later. Now, the session is over, and if there's an announcement, I'll hand over to the coordinator. Thank you very much for all those papers, five, four papers, five papers, including the Pandemic to himself. And so I'm very glad, and so we will give certificates along with this, uh, you know, this Zonzo idea, we call it Zonzo idea. This Zonzo idea can be a hey, hey, Tahian, two day international seminar, the almost a really a Ratana, and one back to Renegade, Ha, and I call Professor R. Hanguma to come forward here and so to receive this one. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. David Goodwig, please come. So your coming is highly appreciated, very much. Thank you very much. Okay, you are giving us international taste. Thank you. Thank you for forcing me. Right. <laughs> Joanna Hicks, please. Yeah, Joanna. Yes. Thank you very much. Your presentation is so interesting. Professor Zekuma. ผู้เสียงคู่มาครับกลุ่มทั้งหมดเลยเดี๋ยวอันกักกวนเวลาทั้งไหนน้องเนี่ยเจ้าบ้านเจ้าดินเดียวอารมณ์เลยกันน้อง